distinguished uh, colleagues, members of the department, and uh, certainly not last, uh, uh, dear student audience. It's a great honor, pleasure, and privilege to be again here at the PA faculty of Universitas Indonesia. Um, as the saying goes, Indonesia being one of the four largest countries in the world, and this being its main largest and best universities, it should, by ranking, be one of the four best universities in the world. Isn't it so? And uh, in a certain sense, it certainly is. And um, by its uh, prominence, by its uh, friendly and um, innovative uh, uh, collegial staff, and uh, by the importance it as the country has in the region and beyond, it was entirely my pleasure to accept the adjunct professorship at this distinguished faculty at this distinguished uh, university. In these um, uh, celebrational events, as we just heard, including the video clip, there is always a little touch of the funeral, right? That it tells you what you did with your life and this is it. And this is why I particularly appreciate Madam Vice Dean's point that this is actually the beginning of more cooperation and of future projects and uh, publications and uh, activities all the way out. So it is a beginning rather than an end, certainly for me, and um, also for us um, all. So thank you once again for bestowing the significant honor on um, myself. Um, it is uh, um, quite usual in the byline of your email to only have three affiliations. And I had that currently. And so now it is time having the certificate to now put uh, Universitas Indonesia there, and that means kicking Harvard out okay. from the line. I have been asked to address you this morning on the topic of from the new public management to the neo bavarian state, um, uh, a frame setting and somehow theoretical topic. So I hope with a student audience, I don't bore you completely with that. If not, I see everybody has their social media out. And if I get too boring, I know you have other things to do. Um, but let me try to talk about the big framework setting of public administration today. And I do think it makes sense if one gets an adjunct professorship in public administration to talk a bit about what public administration is today. happens every time. Now this should work like that. Is it me? So um, the most important theorist globally of what we talk about when we talk about general public administration is the German um, sociologist Max Weber who died in 1920 and who stands very much for our framing of what um, public administration means in the world today. Um, Max Weber is the essential thinker of modernity. That means he addresses our time, um, uh, late capitalism. He is not addressing societies that do not exist anymore. He's not a theorist of times past, but of largely our time. And as a sociologist, his main operational work is that of rationalization. Because if you think about our society, we are trying to be more rational on the personal as well as on the societal and on the state level. And um, the one area where he perhaps wasn't so right is that of disenchantment, with which he means that things become more scientific and less religious. That's not correct. You have heard I am particularly interested in Islamic, Confucian, and Buddhist PA, and um, Weber's insistence of religion going back simply hasn't been proven correct, um, but rationalization and further enchantment live together um, today just as they always did. Weber's contributions to how we look at society um, are as relevant as they always were. 
and uh, his definition of authority, for instance, has not been superseded. So in order to uh, talk about this rationality, Weber describes three forms of authority. The one that is traditional, that means it comes from uh, uh, traditional rulership. The second that comes from personal charisma, that means the impression that the leadership has. And the other one is the legal rational one. That means I am in authority because I, according to the law, can solve the problems that we have. Now, the best, of course, is a combination. You saw uh, before the picture of myself, um, having had the honor of a long audience talking about that with the three sultan of Jakarta, having the Bourbon of the Tenth, who has all three of them. That means he has the traditional authority as the sultan, he has the charismatic personal authority as his father did in a very strong way, and he has the rational legal authority by performing better according to World Bank standards, for instance, in corruption in Jakarta Special Regency than parallel governments have. So, um, but the tendency, this is unusual. It's even unusual in Indonesia, even in Indonesia, it's unique is to move towards the rational legal. But as far as bureaucracy is concerned, and that is something that really fits this morning, mm. is something that Hans-Georg Gadamer said, and Gadamer, uh, one of the great German philosophers of the 20th century, he was actually my personal philosophy teacher. I'm regarded a Gadamerian, somebody who folks his way of of philosophical thinking beyond the state. Um, he died in his 100s and wrote his last original publication on a new topic with 102. So he was blessed with a very old age. And in one of his publications, you see here the number, he says, bureaucratization is as Max Weber has shown the actual fate of our civilization. Why do we, why do you study public administration? because the world in which we live is an administered one. If we step out of this building, as well as in this building, we meet an administered world. And there is no alternative to that. The administered structuring of the modern time in which we live sets the paradigm. It's not business, it's not society, but first of all, whether there is a traffic jam, whether we can take a bus, how the wastewater from the street goes after the rain. These are all administrative questions. And it is Weber's insight to say that. Before, nobody had said bureaucracy is basically an administered environment. And that is what Gadamer means is, if somebody um, from another planet looks at our society, they will say, okay, this is an administered world. And that is the real importance. So political scientists, economists, other people, sociologists, they just do fringe things. But we, we in the faculty of public administration, we study what really matters about this world. Yeah, it's an important thing to say. So you did make all the really right choice. This is the science of our life. Yeah, so. But Weber also has a very specific way of how he defines bureaucracy. And he does that in a book that got actually published after he had died. Um, actually, Weber died, that's quite interesting, of the Spanish flu, which is, of course, the predecessor of COVID-19. It was exactly the same virus just 100 years ago. And he died from the late effects. He got, he got a catch. He lived over it. But then after a few years, he he passed away from that. And so his book, Wirtschaft und Gesellschaft, Economy and Society, got published after his death. And in this, he defines um, the most effective and efficient public administration as a set of offices which um, appoints with appointed civil servants, that means not self-styled or inherited, operated under the following set of principles. Merit selection, you select the people because they're good at that. Hierarchy, you do what your boss tells you because she is your boss, not because you like it. Yeah. 
Wait, do I actually point to this? Division of labor, which increases efficiency from an economics perspective. Exclusive employment means if you work for the civil service, you cannot work also for Pizza Hut or Papa Joe's because then if they have a claim to you, you would treat them differently. Um, career advancement, that means you also get promoted because you're good and not because your uncle is a senior guy in the administration. Written form, that means everything has to be in writing. Why is that important? Because a decision can later be checked if you put it in writing. And by the way, looking at you, some people said people don't write anymore, they call. Yeah, that was before smartphones. Now we actually write more than we ever did. Everything is in writing. And then finally, legality. That means um, bureaucrats can only perform actions if they have empowered by a legal act to do so, not arbitrarily so. If you want to put an acronym on that, it could be HENTCLAW, you know, hierarchy, exclusive, merit, and so on. So this is Weber's set of an efficient and effective administration. Why is that so? Because he thought the increase of rationality would increase speed, scope, predictability, and cost effectiveness as needed for an advanced mass industrial society in which we live. I think Weber, who was quite relativistic and realized where he was in time, would be really disappointed today that we are still thinking that this is the best interpretation of the public sector. He would have said, I'm now dead 100 years and you still haven't moved on. Well, we haven't. It, we thought we had, but we really haven't. And that is the point, of course, of my lecture today. Weber was acutely aware of the problems of Weberian bureaucracy. They are imperialistic, they are slow, they are expensive. There are all kinds of problems. The question is only, do we have a better alternative? He called the system an iron cage in which we are locked and in which, for instance, charismatic politicians have a role to get us out of it. But Weber was not a Weberian in that sense. You sometimes can analyze things without particularly liking him. Dr. Alzheimer, a medical professor, didn't like Alzheimer's disease. It's just named after him. Yeah? So a little bit like that it is with Weber. Now, today it's 2024, and we would say, isn't this horrible Western? Isn't this against this post-colonialism stuff? We are saying that all bureaucracy is the same everywhere in the globe. Good point. But Weber actually did try to have a global perspective on PA, and he did study other administrations and saw extremely strong virtue in other administrative systems as well. Weber never said everybody has to conform to Western rules. And his study of the most important alternative, even today, to Western administration, namely the Chinese, the Confucian system. Actually, we have original Confucian systems in Korea and China and in Vietnam, the three basic Confucian countries. Um, and today, of course, Singapore is a, is a Confu half Confucian system, um, has been studied in a brilliant text by Weber, actually so brilliant that for 20 years, it was the most cited book on that topic in China itself. Yeah? So Weber did be aware of that, but he's also aware of why Confucian PA and Weberian PA are different. Now, here I am phrasing on this last rare February day, the 29th, very special anniversary, only any four day, any four years, uh, Weberian PA. But Weberian PA for many in the public administration, public management uh, was uh, discourse was a negative term. Weberian PA, the old, the expensive, the bureaucratic. You know, in reality, we PA guys are the only people who use the term bureaucratic in a neutral sense. Everybody else thinks it's an insult. Yeah? If I say you bureaucrat, it's never a compliment. Right? But for us in PA, bureaucracy is a phenomenon, not something negative. 
But Weberian PA was a real issue or was perceived to be a real issue. And so in the 70s, a critique from the economics and business side took place culminating in the main alternative to PA, the so-called new public management, which is the transfer of business techniques and economic thinking to the public sector. The problem is, A, it's a bad theory because citizens are not customers, and B, it doesn't work. Yeah? The best bus administration of the new public management is a bus that stops at every bus stop exactly at the right time and never gets any passengers on board because they're just disturbing. That's NPM for you. And that is why NPM is out. Yeah? As uh, this nice saying goes about the Taj Mahal in India, the Taj would not have been so beautiful if Shah Jahan has asked for three quotations and decided for the lowest. Yeah, because we want public value creation in the public sector, not cheap things. The state is not a little boy that is saving for a bike or a little girl saving for the last iPhone. Yeah, or switch this, it's just the same. Yeah, so this is relatively late. In the famous fresco in the Siena City Town Hall, the most famous Western depiction of good PA, there is this kind of thing of the three vices that ruin bad government. Greed or cheapness, arrogance, and pride. The difference between arrogance and pride is to say, oh, I'm way better than you, and oh my gosh, I'm so beautiful. You know, these are not the same. We use the same English word for that sometimes, vanity, but it's actually different. Whether you think you're better, or you think you're beautiful. Both is wrong, but greed and waste are the same. And look at the monster in the middle. Lorenzetti says these three vices being cheap create tyranny. And if arrogance, pride, and being cheap is not the basis of the new public management, I really don't know. It's now 25 years that Evans and Rauch wrote their famous article about Weberian practices in development countries. So 1999, quarter a century ago, in which they unchallenged proof that Weberian PA characteristics actually significantly enhance prospects of economic growth. If you have a Weberian PA, your development goes up. If you don't, it doesn't. Now, by today, we would say that's the case also for developed countries, and we don't use terms like developing so much anymore, but still it's a really important point to make. Oops, that was, this clicky is not perfect, so you already saw some stuff, trying to go back. And with my colleague Tina Ran, I'm really not guilty for that, but in PA we should never put the blame on others, but make it work, right? Mm. One of the main authors of the topic, the great Christopher Pollitt, as a co-author with his assistants, uh, uh, wrote an article in Public Management Review in which he argued that in Central and Eastern Europe, new public management actually does work, but it actually doesn't. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, we have no study, no comparative study that claims that new public management works. It doesn't save money, it doesn't deliver services. It came to deliver more for less money. It was there to deliver less for more money. The most famous case of the new public management that you sometimes still see is New Zealand, which was the poster child of the NPM. And so the end of NPM was when New Zealand, which has privatized its rail services, republicized the rail services because private rails cost more and have a worse economic impact because less people take the rail and then for the budget line in the end, it may help, but for the sustainable budget of a country, ecologically speaking, having less trains doesn't work. I was in, 19, in 2019 at the IRSPM conference on a panel with a civil service co commissioner of New Zealand. And he said, whenever I see a civil servant, I go to her, I shake her hand and I say, thank you. That is the totally different attitude than NPM. Today, I would say New Zealand is one of the most neo barbarian countries in the world. And that is exactly the point, because 
we are not talking about the death of managerialism. Managerialism is important. It helps us in many ways. So, no, not the death of managerialism. But we need to look at it in a new way. Weber talked about the administration of Berlin in the year 1900. But Berlin in the year 1900 doesn't exist anymore. Some of these buildings do still exist, but that's kind of it. Yeah. I once at a Bangkok point said that Germany doesn't have a Bavarian good administration anymore. And then Prof. Echo, actually, who was on the panel, asked me, what do you mean? Why is German administration so bad? So I'm not going to say it this time as to not get a challenging question again, although it was a really good one. Um, but what I will say is that the most important textbook on public management, Politz, the aforementioned, and Bukert's book on public management reform, now in its fourth edition, um, came up with the term of the neo-Weberian state. And that is what I now want to talk. So not Weberian, the old, but neo-Weberian. And um, the nice thing, this is an empty parking lot. It's sometimes said there is a drunk person who looks for his car keys under a lamp, and his friend comes and says, is that where you lost your car key? And he says, no, that's not where I lost it, but it's easier to look here because it's light. That doesn't make sense. NPM is the same. It looks for a solution to a real problem, but in the wrong space. So what Pollitt and Bukert argue, what the neo weberian state is, that we retain from the Weberian principle the central role of the state, representative democracy for legitimacy, administrative law as the structure in which it works, and public service as a distinct form. You don't contract everything out. You have a public service. But with the following neo element learned from the new public management, citizen orientation, citizen input, Results orientation, outcome matters, not only process, and professionalization. Not managerialism, but professionalization in a managerial sense. These are really needed. And in fact, I would also say there are too many administrations who do not check these four boxes yet. So we need to work on that. Not every traditional structure is a neo Weberian state. And so this is the Pollitt and Bukert. Public management reform definition, third and fourth edition. And I agree with this. So this is what we can say is the mainstream. This is how the history of the reforms went. Everything started Weberian. Then the NPM started, but some people stayed Weberian. Then NPM ended, and it did at around 2000. And then various post-NPM paradigms stayed. Some people stayed Weberian, some people stayed NPM. Then neo Weberian state, new public governance, which is more policy oriented, whereas neo Weberian state is more PA oriented. Um, and then other forms like joint of government, whole of government, and also the value government approach. Some people actually think NWS is part of whole of government and so on. So there are various views, but I think this is correct. Let me make a footnote here based on a reminder yesterday on my transport from the airport to here. Since we are in Indonesia, are you missing a paradigm on this sheet? You might, because some of you might think, where's Prof Wolfgang putting the new public service here? Well, ladies and gentlemen, the new public service is not part of the global discourse on public management reform. It is not mentioned in international conferences. The only place I've ever seen where people discuss new public service, other than maybe at the home of Denhardt and Denhardt themselves, is Indonesia. And for some reason, it seems the UNDP is pushing this here, and I have no idea why. This is not a serious part of the global PA discussion. I would love to see an article by some of my colleagues here of how this new public service made it into the Indonesian discourse. Who pushed this and why? Because it's simply not part of the global discourse. Now, we thought 
all of these organizations perhaps ended with three recent transformations. Global financial crisis, 2008, but it didn't. Digitalization, doesn't digitalization change bureaucracy? No, it doesn't. And sustainability and the global heritage that we have. But the global financial crisis needed to be managed by a high capacity administration, check for barbarian. The digitalization, all top digitalized countries have implemented it because of the push of a traditional barbarian bureaucracy, check for barbarianism. I will say a few words more later. And sustainability, you know, if you want a green transition, who's going to manage that if not a capable bureaucracy? You're not going to get carbon neutrality from contracting out. Digitalization. My main professorship is in Estonia. Estonia is at least rumored to be the leading digital country in the world. It is one of the leading, certainly. And so what am I saying there? Isn't there a digital transformation? Well, it depends of how you define it. I like to say that there is no digital transformation. If you define digital transformation, if you say, Digitization is to put documents into the digital. If you say digitalization is to change processes and then mean digital transformation is how you change organizations, ladies and gentlemen, most organizations haven't changed. Even in digital top countries, I've written that together with my colleague Rainer Kattel in Public Money and Management um, in an in a essay based on an intervention in the House of Lords, if Churchill would get up from the dead, walk Whitehall down and go into any office, he would recognize every single administrative structure. Nothing has changed since World War II. Nothing. Organizations haven't changed. Nor, by the way, what is the leading digital country in the world? I know it's not too popular to say here, but yeah, it's Singapore. And Singapore's administration is not networked. It's hierarchized. And they put through the best digitalization. So this is the context there. And in fact, let's look at the hardware. Most of you have either laptop over or the smartphone. Look at your smartphone now. Who built this? What I can tell you, whether you have an Apple or a Samsung or a Huawei or something, well, no, you all have the top brands. It's UI, so nobody here is Oppo or anything like that or Xiaomi. But uh, you know, everybody's rich. These are the gadgets of the digital society. There is no digitality without a smartphone. The smartphone has been made by a hierarchy. Samsung is run like a military. Huawei is owned by the military. These are completely hierarchical firms. Our digital society is based on efficient hierarchical firms. Yeah? So digital transformation Absolutely not. And that brings us, why I'm saying this, is because it brings us back to the importance of the barbarian thing. But a few things have been changed. I'm well on time. That's very nice. And um, so I have two gadgets here. First is the smartphone. Some people could think I actually put this point on the smartphone here so that I can keep my smartphone at the lectern because as you know, if you have your smartphone somewhere else, you get nervous, right? Um, but second gadget is this issue of Max Weber studies. And that is the picture you actually, when you saw the poster for today's events, I'm holding it up like this. So this is an issue of Max Weber studies that I edited. Max Weber studies, why this is special, is, is a journal for Weber researchers, not for public administration people. So these are the real experts on Weber who have read all the hundreds of volumes in the collected edition and who spent their lives studying Weber. Mostly they're sociologists or historians, but public administration scholars normally do not deal so much with Weber. So me and the editor in chief of this journal, or I should say the editor in chief of this journal and me, thought about having an issue in Max Weber studies on Weberian PA today, so as to bridge this gap. And it worked rather well, I think. And um, so this is why we have this issue on the neo-Weberian state. Um, there is no fifth edition of the Pollitt and Bookert book because the great Christopher Pollitt passed away a few years ago, much too early. 
And uh, Professor Bukert didn't want to write a fifth edition just yet, but he had thought about how to update it with the new societies we have. And his essay in here is basically the thought of the fifth edition of this. And then we had a couple of colleagues, as you see here, including Professor Shimada from Kyoto and other good friends discussing this, including myself. And uh, so my essay is the new neo variant state. That means what does the update mean? Although here already it gets kind of funny, the new neo variant state. But still, I think it's fair to say. So what does neo variant state mean? This published in January 2023. So it's really the post-COVID world, the sustainability and the inclusion world that we have today. So what would I say about this? First of all, once again, in public administration and bureaucracy, we must make a differentiation between Weberian versus Weber's PA. And you already know what I mean with this. Weber's PA is this Prussian 1900 highly efficient structure. It worked extremely well then, but really this is not our world anymore. But you can't say that Weber's overall insight into the administered high capacity world is obsolete. The two are not connected. That's why Weberian PA is as fresh today as it was when he developed it, whereas Weber's PA can be fruitfully criticized. But what means good Weberian PA today? What characteristics must Weberian PA have today globally and here if we want to look at this? And I propose three points. The first, remember that I said Weber was his own worst critic or better the critic of Weberian PA. This idea of imperialism, of hierarchy, of too much structure and of long, long, long bureaucracy. such as getting an Indonesian SIM card. That is something that Weber would, first of all, have critiqued as well. So Weber carries his own critique in himself. He realizes this unencaged thing. Second, we have to acknowledge with all diversity and inclusion that most people want to live a normal, decent life. You want to be in your place. You want to be in peace. You want to have your health care. You want to have a decent education for the kids. This kind of normal life at home in your family yeah, is one of the things that is fundamental for most people in peace societies of a good life. And it is Weberian PA that is the most conducive to guaranteeing this. As I mentioned in an article, and later our boss at UCL, Mariana Mazzucato, repeated that, during COVID, whether you lived in a Weberian PA or not could make the difference between life and death. In Weberian PA, you survive. And very importantly, for today's diversity and inclusion issue, in redefining what rational PA is, some people have said, oh, Weberian, this is this white, hierarchical, Eurocentric PA. No, it's not. Weber, who was very sensitive of this point, would have said that today, diversity and inclusion are part of a rational PA. They're not optional extras, but we need to embrace that today. Um, a colleague of ours in um, the West Coast of the US wrote a paper on India in which he argued that Indian colonial administration that only had white administrators from Britain had a higher death rate than a similar administration in a nearby principality that had half Indians in the administration. And he said, so Weberian administration kills people. No, it does not, because if your health administration kills more people, it's not rational in Weber's sense. Weber would have been the first to say that diversity, equality, and inclusion are part of rationality, not in addition to it. And once we realize Weber's critique of Weberian PA, or Weber's critique of Weber's PA, the helpfulness of Weber for a happy life for normal people in all strata of society, and finally, equality, diversity, and inclusion as part of what rational PA 
today is, then we have an image of good neo-barbarian PA for us, of what it would mean. Yeah? But sometimes the opposite is true. Sometimes bureaucracy might not have. Hannah Arendt once said, niemand hat das Recht zu gehorchen, nobody has the right to obey. Weber sometimes is accused of fostering an administration that just implements whatever government does. I would say today, Weber would have loved in Southeast Asia most the administrators in Myanmar from the civil service resistance movement who do not work for this fake military fascist crooks pretending to have a government in Myanmar. Myanmar doesn't have a government today. It has a bunch of criminal mafiosos pretending to be a government in order to kill the people. I mean, in two weeks ago, we had a picture of Myanmar soldiers burning kids alive, right? Hanging them from the tree and burning them. That is not a government. And resisting against that from civil service in not making it work, that is the best of Weberian public service in that point. I should acknowledge here that in ASEAN, which has not been doing very well in the Myanmar case, Indonesia has played a great role in insisting on human rights and on decent administration in the former Burma. Now back to Weber. My second appointment, as I mentioned, is in London at UCL. And one of the great sites in London, you might know St. Paul's Cathedral. And St. Paul's Cathedral was built, designed by the great architect Sir Christopher Wren for this kind of neoclassic architecture, the most famous of the architects. But Christopher Wren does not have a monument, and he is buried in his cathedral. But if you go there, there is no image. There is just a plaque. And it says, if you want a monument, look around. Because his monument is his church. We do not have a monument for Weber. Weber doesn't have a statute. There is no Weber statute anywhere in the world. And there doesn't need to be, because all we need to do in a decent society is go outside and look around. And if it's done well by the bureaucracy, that is the monument for Max Weber. And we need to reinterpret and align this with our values today. But once we do, this seems to be not fully, but tendentially, the ticket for a well-administrated society for the best of all of us and all citizens. And that is what Max Weber's meaning is in today's concept, critically adopting and adapting, but still adopting and adapting for the best of the community, which is what PA must be about. Thank you so much for your attention.